healing power of breath work from my perspective. Okay, so this is my perspective. This is based on all the research that I've done since uh, healing myself from a chronic illness, myself recovering, where breath work was a big part of my uh, overall recovery. Okay, so now let's get into the nitty gritty of breath work and its effects on the body. Okay, so firstly, pharmaceuticals versus breath for healing your body. Now, this is a very interesting subject. So we rely a lot on medications for our overall health, okay, and well-being. Now, here's the thing. The effectiveness of medications has come into question and there is evidence to suggest that actually one of the top killers in the world is medical mistakes and alongside with that is prescription medication and getting the dosages wrong the side effects over prescribing things like that so what i wanted to talk about here is you know do we need to be consuming all of these pills that we're being prescribed is there other ways okay and Thankfully, there's more and more medical practitioners waking up to the holistic techniques that are available today, the complementary techniques that um, aid the healing process. Not to take away from pharmaceutical medications because they do have their time and place, but to actually be a complement to somebody's healing journey so that people aren't dependent on these medications. So they don't get into a point where they're taking so many different pills for their ills. Okay, there's a saying that goes, there is not a pill for every ill, but there is an ill following every pill. And that's true, because the more uh, you get dependent on medication, the more risk you have the side effects. And then you need, need to take more uh, different pills for those uh, side effects. Like this was happening to me uh, when I had the illness. You know, I was getting side effects and then getting prescribed other medications to help with the side effects, which is not the most effective thing we can do. Now, the thing is, we're also extremely dependent on medications and they're a huge business. Okay, they're a huge, huge, huge business. Okay, so one of the big problems is that we, as a society, are now consuming more pills than ever before. It's like one in five people in America, or one in six, are on some kind of medication for their happiness, for depression. Because it's, depression's become such a big problem in the world. There's a lot of prescribing going on for medication, for depression. Now, this is a big problem because from the holistic approach, we know that the more depressed you get, the more and stress is a, is a precursor for depression, the more likely you are to getting sick of other things. And if you are just, and the problem with medication, I used to use this analogy in the pharmacy, that is that pills are like, like this. So somebody bashes their head against the wall, right? And they get a, 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 a swelling on their head. They take, they take ice and put the ice on the wound to relieve the swelling. But if that person keeps bashing their head against the wall, it doesn't matter uh, how much ice you've got, the swelling is just going to keep getting worse and worse. So what's the real treatment in this situation? The treatment would be to stop that patient from bashing their head against the wall, right? However, the problem is that the ice is like drugs and we're giving way too many drugs as frontline to patients rather than actually going to the cause of the problem itself. Okay, we are waking up more and more to these techniques that are out there for managing your lifestyle. However, it's still very secondary. And according to Hippocratic Oath, which states first do no harm, we as doctors and, and medical professionals and pharmacists, we should do whatever we can to avoiding harm to a patient. We should try everything we can first to help that patient. And the last resort is pills or the surgeries, the machines. However, that's changed and now they've become frontline treatments. This is a big problem. So what are we gonna do about this? Well, this is where one of our roles as SOMA instructors is going to be very important, is helping people with their lifestyle and arming people with tools that they can use to stop them from getting into an emerging situation, where, which is where doctors are brilliant. Uh, they're fantastic at solving uh, an acute bacterial infection, something like that. They're brilliant at that. They can save your life with their medications, techniques, and tools. But when it comes to chronic conditions, not so good because these are diseases of lifestyle. And as I said, epigenetics plays a role here as well and that certain genes can be switched on and off based on your environment. And uh, every cell in your body has a consciousness and every cell comes together based on the principles of love, trust and communication and collaboration. This is how we evolved. Millions of years ago, 
We were single cell organisms constantly fighting with each other. And then one day two cells came together to form a multicellular organism that evolved eventually into us. And those cells came together because they got tired of fighting with each other and they came together on the principles of love trust, health, and communication, collaboration, cooperation. And then they formed a stronger, more stable structure than what was previously before. And then that's what we have today. And now we are actually a being where we have many layers. We have a, a system of micro microbes. Actually, we're more microbes than we are human cells. We have actually three times the amount of microbial cells than human cells. And we actually have like an aura, fungi and microbes. It gives us another layer of consciousness. Even our gut, our nervous system, our brain uh, are all part of the same kind of brain, like true brain. And the, the brain isn't the one inside our head. It's actually, you could argue, every single cell in our body. There's another saying that goes, where is the mind? Never mind, because we don't actually know what the mind is, but we do know that the mind and body are not separate. You should not separate the mind and body. So what we need to do is to understand how the body affects the mind and the mind affects the body. And this is where the breath comes in. And it also goes back to the ancient story the, from the Vedic, uh, the Rig Veda, the, the, the ancient manuscript from the Vedic tradition, the, the Rig Veda, thousands and thousands of years ago, which tells the story of a time when humans were addicted to plant or a, a ritual of some kind. We don't even know if it's a plant. We don't actually know what it is. But it is. it was called the soma. And they were addicted to it and dependent on it. It was something on the external that they would consume. And what happened was that the soma starts to run out. And when the soma starts to run out, they all freak out. It either gets controlled by some other forces or... It just runs out because they move to areas where it doesn't grow anymore. Nobody actually knows the truth about this. But what this is a great legend. It, it tells a great analogy about what's going on now. And actually, in order to break their addiction to this dependency, the, the god Indra told everyone, we must go inward to figure out how to create the soma within. And that's when the, the origin of tantra, pranayama, yoga, meditation, all these techniques evolved. And they became systems of us being able to control the inner world and wake up this inner pharmacy. They discover we have the inner pharmacy where we can create all of the things that, that exist in nature that we use as medicines. We can actually manufacture them ourselves. And the breath is a primary mechanism of waking this inner pharmacy up. So let's talk about that and these ancient practices and how they relate okay, to healing. So we've talked about medication. And one of the big problems with medication is that all drugs are subjected to the first past effect. So what is the first past effect? The first past effect means when you basically consume a chemical, instead of it going through a normal metabolic pathway, it goes straight to the liver because your body thinks that this is a foreign substance. So your liver deals with it. Now over time, this can lead to toxification of the liver. And if that isn't treated properly, that begins the process of causing fatty liver. And non-alcoholic cirrhosis of liver is one of the biggest problems we have at the moment that's growing as an epidemic due to over-prescribing of medications and people living on these factory-based diets. So alcohol is known to give cirrhosis of the liver. Okay, that's a common thing. But the fact that now we're getting cirrhosis of the liver caused by chemicals is a huge problem that we have to deal with and one of the big problems with consuming lots of pharmaceutical pills and the other problem with medication is that it's not intelligent like in terms of it can't treat the whole drugs just treat factors in the body and they are work they are based on linear models of how the body works and these linear models and scientific principles are based on a reductionist view of how the body works so but what, what that means is, and this goes to the whole point of there's no one size fits all. When you're treating a chronic issue, like a chronic disease, uh, if you try and, and, and put people into a box and say that there is an average for everybody, like an average uh, blood pressure for everybody, this is where the problem occurs. Because if you just try and control blood pressure to prevent heart disease and, and f ignore all of the other reasons that cause heart disease, you start to cause a problem, a big problem. Here's the reason why. Because with linear approaches 
and making everyone into an, an average. If you say everyone's average blood pressure is 120 over 80, what happens is you forget that actually everyone is unique and that what is a if 120 over 80 is, is healthy for one person, it may not be healthy for another person. And what's normal blood pressure for one person is not gonna be normal for another person. This actually, if you wanna learn more about this, check out Dr. BM Hegde. He's one of India's top doctors. He is a cardiac surgeon. He talks about this in great depth and how the pharmaceutical system is based on reductionist science and it's not good for treating chronic conditions. Because, let me give you an, some examples of this. Gandhi, guess what his blood pressure was? His blood pressure throughout his life was 200 over 100, okay? But what did he die of? He died of a bullet to his head when he was 80 years old, 80 plus years old. So, he, and when they did the post-mortem, he had no problems with his health at all. He was very healthy. He had very high blood pressure. Now, here's the thing. If you go into a doctor's surgery and you get prescribed a, a pill because you go and get one blood pressure med checkup done and they say, oh, your blood pressure is a little bit elevated. It's above uh, 120 over 80, you know, Firstly, your blood pressure may be high on that particular day for so many different reasons. And plus, you may also be a little bit fearful of seeing the doctor. You get this white coat syndrome. That's why you must always get best out of three, go to three different doctors if they're going to do a, a health checkup on you to get different perspectives because you'll, be, you'll find that it's different on different days, that the diagnosis is different on different days. So you must always get second opinions or third opinions when you're given a prescription for a medication, just to check. And the problem with this is that once you're on that pill and you're, say you've got actually a normal blood pressure, you're, you're actually healthy, the blood pressure's fine. You start messing up, messing around with using a chemical, one metric in your body. This can have consequences for the functions of your organs in, in other areas. And then that can lead, because blood pressure is very important. If you start messing with your own blood pressure and your own ability to self-regulate your blood pressure, it can lead to serious consequences. And this is the problem we have with the healthcare system, is that then people get prescribed other medications to mitigate the side effects. So what if we could have our own method to relieve blood pressure, to create our own ways to combat stress without relying on, on drugs that aren't that intelligent. Wouldn't that be a great thing? So this is where these alternative systems are pranayama, and, and I hate to use the word alternative. They should be complementary, not alternative. They, they, are, they all work together. This is where they come in. So let's now understand the role of and how that can help. So your breath is something that can run on autopilot where you don't even are not conscious aware of it, or you can take conscious control over it. It means that it is both voluntary and involuntary function. Now, because of that, it means that using the breath, we actually have a conscious ability to control the autonomic nervous system. And this is another thing that science has kind of educated us out of. We've been told that we have no control over the autonomic nervous system, the part of the nervous system that controls your blood pressure, your immune system, digestion, all of the things that we take for granted, your heart rate, all of that. So with the breath, we can actually tap into this autonomic nervous system and actually control the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. We'll talk about that in more depth in a bit. And with the breath, because it's under your control, conscious control, you can use techniques to bring yourself back into balance every single day. There is way more aligned with your natural state, which medication can't do. The drugs and, and having a dose of a pill every day cannot do this long term. Whereas you can, when you start to feel the symptoms of stress, say you're, you're, you're getting the nervous tension in your chest, you can relieve that stress. You can use breath techniques to relieve that stress in that moment and do it in an intelligent way, right? You can do it in the moment when it's needed. This is one of the other useful tools of breath is relief, relieving stress. And I will argue that stress and different forms of stress, physical and emotional, are some of the strongest triggers for chronic diseases. That's right. And stress comes in in different forms. We'll talk about that as well in a bit. But what I want you to understand is that the breath and the different ways and different rhythms of breath and your exhalation, your inhalation is your method of tapping into the inner world and 
for you to take control of the stress response itself consciously. This is incredible. This is giving the power back to you. Now, over the years, there have been like yogis like Swami Rama who went to America and he went under investigation and they showed that he could slow his heart rate right down. He could speed it up. He could change his temperature up and down. He baffled scientists. In recent times, like Wim Hof has done the same thing gone in and done studies on himself showing with the breath you can modulate your autonomic nervous system. I have done it myself through my own healing journey and now with so many people going through our courses we're seeing people creating results for themselves that could only be explained by them being able to tap in to their own inner world and influence it through their own conscious control. Something that we've been told we can't do. And it can only be explained through what the ancients have known thousands of years ago and, and made into these systems of healing. But the drugs have a time and place. They're great for emerging situations. They can be great for lowering the inflammation initially, but inflammation and stress that causes it and all these different factors of stress are things that we, only we can solve ourselves. We can't rely on the doctor to solve these things with their little magic pills. We must take control ourselves over our own healing. And the breath is your first method for doing this. 